please have it open. We're going to read today. Um, and <clears throat> John 7 and 8 can be looked at together um, as they really are the, the confrontation sermons of Jesus. Um, you're going to see uh, critics confronting him, and then you see Jesus responding. Uh, and there's different groups uh, that he is responding to. I mean, have we had a phenomenal journey in John thus far, or what? I mean, every chapter of John has just absolutely rocked us, hasn't it? I mean, we began with John 1, right, where this uneducated fisherman writes what is the answer of what every philosopher was just, just meandering after, right? As you think of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and how they said that perhaps Right, the invisible, uh, unseen, higher power would reveal himself to us with a thought, with a voice, with a whisper, any sign. And then what does John do in John chapter 1? He gives the answer to that, right? Centuries later and says, in the beginning was the logos, the expression of God. He's saying Jesus Christ is what every philosopher and every thinker has been thinking after. And it's just to see an uneducated fisherman write one of the most powerful, uh, one of the most, I mean, um, the deepest uh, set of sayings in John chapter 1 when he talks about the logos. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then John 1, 14, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. And then he talks about him being full of grace and truth and coming with grace. The Moses came with the law, but the logos came with grace, right? And we were rocked by that. Spent weeks there because we were rocked by it. I just want to share this so that you're appreciating John's gospel because remember, it's all about being biblically literate. And when we're through with this, you should be able to go back to John and then share with others, disciple others. And the same way I'm just running down memory lane, you should be able to have your own memory lane. It means that you're looking back at your notes and rehearsing, but repetition is good, right? John chapter 2, and remember the whole theme of John, the whole theme of John is found in John, what is it, chapter 20, and I believe it is verse 31, uh, where he says, all of this is written, the whole purpose of John's gospel is what? That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, is the Messiah, is the promised one, that you might believe that Jesus is God in the flesh, the Son of God, and that not just believing by intellectual assent, but by receiving him, you might have eternal life through his name. That is the whole purpose of John's gospel, right? So John chapter 1, he begins by sharing that Jesus Christ is the whisper, the expression of the invisible God that every great thinker and philosopher was meandering after. John chapter 2, the first miracle Jesus does is turn water into wine, showing again that he is the creator, right? Um, John chapter 3, we see him telling uh, the religious leader Nicodemus um, how one gets to heaven and he is speaking as the word of God giving him the final word of God. John chapter 4, we see the woman at the well and Jesus revolutionizing her life as she runs and says to all of her town, come and hear from a man who spoke to me as no human has ever spoken to me. John chapter 5, he heals the man who's crippled at the pool of Bethesda. And as tradition and even as a few verses uh, imply in John chapter 5, that he was crippled for 38 years from what seemed to be a sin. Uh, and tradition says it was a sexually transmitted disease that had rendered him crippled. Jesus not only heals him, but he heals him on the Sabbath day, making clear that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Again, I just want to encourage you to go back and look at how every chapter is pointing. It is a different presentation. It's not chronological here. John is a constructed argument, right? It's seven miracles. It's seven I am statements. It's a constructed argument all to make clear and to convince the reader that Jesus is the Son of God uh, and how uh, you can have eternal life through his name. It's all of the gospel. Every story is the gospel, right? John chapter 6, we see the feeding of the 5,000 as he takes five little barley biscuits and two salted sardines. 
five loaves and two fishes, multiplies it, showing again that he is the creator, that he is Elohim, the same one who in Genesis chapter 1 created everything just by his word, right? So then we come <clears throat> to John 7, and it's good to have this review because we're going to see some things pop up in John 7 that you might have forgotten about uh, from John 5, but the ones who want to kill Jesus, the religious rulers, they remember stuff that happened in John 5, okay? So as we're reading today, you're going to see that he's making reference to things that happened a few chapters ago. Uh, and mind you, while John is not chronological, right? Uh, as you read Luke, Luke is chronological. John is not chronological, but John 7 definitely came after John 5. Does, it, do you, does that make sense? This is not a chronological gospel, but what we're going to read in John 7 definitely came after John 5 because it's going to come up in this dispute. Let me just share this so we can just kind of have our minds just set, right? Jesus came to wage war against darkness, right? To wage war against sin, which destroys, right? He is love, right? God is love, 1 John 4, 8, right? Love edifies, Love would not be love unless it was vehemently opposed to what breaks down, tears down, and destroys. Sin and darkness are the opposite, right? Love would not be perfect in love if he were not vehemently opposed to everything that detracts and opposes love, right? Great perspective there. So, yes, when Christ comes, he comes and he wages war against darkness. He wages war against death, and he conquers death by raising from the dead, the resurrection, there's another thing that he came to wage war with, and that's religion. Religion. Churchianity. Not Christianity. You read the Bible and follow the Bible your best, verse by verse, line upon line, precept upon precept. You know who you're going to look like? You're going to look like Jesus. But when you take a little bit here, a little bit there, and mix a little bit of, well, this is how we always did things, and this is what's popular, and oh, I don't need to reference the Bible, we just kind of do it this way, and then routine sets in, and then after routine, you're doing it by rote, and then after doing it by rote, you get in a rut, where now it's just nothing but the rote. That can get in the way of the spirit, that can get in the way of a relationship, right? Right? And there's something in us as fallen human beings where we can create something and totally let it get in the way of a relationship with God where it's just us doing this church thing, this religion thing on some weird, funky autopilot. And because it has a moral backbone to it, it can, it can and Jesus' name is still mentioned, it can look like it's of the Spirit of God, but it's just religion. And what the Pharisees, what the Jewish leaders had devolved into at the time when Christ came were a bunch of people who created a system that did not look like God. It did not make people thirsty for God. It was not love. Uh, it did not draw people. Uh, it actually pushed people away. It did not set people free. It actually put burdens on their shoulders, right? So Jesus is coming, and he is also waging war against that. And you need to realize that the majority of his opposition that you read about in the Gospels was not from the pimps, uh, the hustlers, uh, and the stick-up kids, and the tax collectors. It was from the religious rulers. It was from the church folk that so had their system and their way of doing things and so enjoyed the attention they got that they didn't want to give up that seat even if God should come down in the flesh and, and request it. So having set that stage, let's now read John 7. And what you're going to see is you're going to see his critics. Um, and lest we just be so ready to take all of these people in our minds and just put them in a barrel and send them over Niagara Falls, we need to realize that the same stuff in them is in every one of us. I mean, it's almost like, oh, wow, let me see how I can identify, you know, you know, with the woman, you know, caught in adultery. Let me see how I can identify with the man at the pool of Bethesda who needs healing. Let me see how I can identify with the estranged leper, right? And, oh, oh, I can see so much of myself in these people, and I praise God for his love. Oh, but the Pharisees, the religious rulers, <laughs> I hate them. There's nothing, <laughs> they, me and them have nothing in common. They're the bad guys. No, 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 because of what happened in the Garden of Eden, <laughs> we're all the bad guys. 
Uh, And what is in every person on the pages of Scripture, you read of any human on the pages of Scripture, including Judas, and what is in him is in you without the grace of Christ. That's why it's so true. The only good thing about any of us is Jesus. And without Jesus, we're all monsters. Can I get an amen? Amen. Capital M monsters or lowercase m monsters? Now do you see why even when Paul was set to be beheaded, what did he refer to himself as? The chief of sinners. What does that mean? He was saying, I, the more I study Christ, the more I follow him, the more I realize how much I fall short, I'm the chief of sinners. It meant he's saying that if you went to a village and the village was called sinners and you said, take me to your chief, that they would lead you to some wicker chair in the middle of whatever and Paul would be sitting there. That's how he referred to himself. So let's read this today. And as we see the critics, this chapter is full of critics. Let's understand what Jesus, how Jesus looks when put up against a critical religious culture. And then let's also look at the critic that's brewing inside every one of us. And ultimately, what Jesus, because he's a physician, right? He brings not just a diagnosis to every person, but a way out, a way, a way out, a way to be like him, right? Uh, Let me just ask this. Uh, Would you say that you're a critical person? Now, not discerning. All of us are called to be discerning. And what do we discern with? What? Our gut feelings? Our heart? Our street smarts? No, what do we discern with? We discern with the Word of God. The Word of God is the final authority on all things, right? But when I just take a little bit of the Word of God and a little bit of assumption, and I'm not really making sure that I'm studying the context of the Word of God, Or I think I'm leaning on the word of God, but I'm really just leaning on the tradition of how my old church or denomination interpreted the word of God. Well, you can create something that actually is not identical with the heart of Christ and with the very word of God. So let's just begin by making this clear. The word of God is clear. The word of God uh, is easy to understand. Ephesians 4 even makes clear that's why the Lord has set up the pastor teacher for the purpose of teaching the word. And then it says that all of us are to go back and be Bereans and make sure that what I'm saying lines up with the word, right? Because at the end of the day, I'm just the man, right? We want to be Bereans. It says they listened to Paul, then they went and double checked to make sure that what Paul said lined up with the word. The word is the final authority. But what happens is when there's more leaning into our own understanding, more leaning into churchianity, and more prideful assumption than there is biblical literacy and the heart of Christ, you end up with a critic. And if you're going to do radical ministry for the Lord, I'm going to tell you now, you better be ready to deal with critics. If you want to do radical ministry for the Lord, you're going to have to come to terms with the critic within yourself. But there's good news here because, yes, this is another day where the Word of God will be a scalpel, and what scalpels are designed to do is take out uh, things that are just underneath the surface that need to come out. But it's also good news. This chapter actually leads you on how to be freed from criticism. So if you feel like you're the world's biggest critic uh, and you just kind of hate it and you want a way out, uh, this actually gives you a way out too, right? So if you want to write in your notes, critics, or you might want to write a hater. That's really, what, what is a hater? We all know what a hater is, right? You're going to see Jesus deal with a whole bunch of haters, right? Um, and then we're going to look at the hater in each of us and how to be freed from that. Ready? So let's go. John 7, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. Remember this. Israel, right? Where Christ is, the Holy Land, it's about the size of the state of New Jersey, right? Just like you have North Jersey, Central Jersey, and South Jersey, you have Galilee, right? Samaria, where the Samaritans were. Today it's called the West Bank in the news. And then Judea in the bottom, which is where uh, Bethlehem uh, and Jerusalem are, right? The majority of Jesus' ministry took place in Galilee. Galilee would be considered like the, the sticks, Um, those down in Jerusalem, where all the religious centers were, where Jerusalem was and what have you, they looked down on Galilee. Um, If you wanted um, public uh, approval, if you wanted to go viral, (laughs) 
Galilee is not where you would do your ministry. If you wanted to make a name for yourself, you would do it down in Jerusalem. You wouldn't be up there spending all of your time where the quote-unquote people who, whose opinions mattered, quote-unquote, actually looked down on. Isn't it interesting? Verse 1, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. The majority of Jesus' ministry was in Galilee. Isn't it amazing how God comes down and just totally overturns the table of, of weird uh, human thinking uh, based on a weird human evaluation system. Uh, he is the God of the underdog. He spends a majority of his ministry in the very place where if you wanted to go viral, you should spend the least part of your ministry. Whoa, that's our Jesus, ain't it? Right? Because all of us is the very underdog, right? Whom he came to save and set his love upon us. Let's keep going. It says, he walked in Galilee because he would not walk in Jewry. What Jewry means is where the Jewish religious leaders were, down in the south, down in Jerusalem, where the temple was. Why? Because the Jews were trying to kill him at this point. Why did they want to kill him? Because he healed a crippled man who, again, tradition says was crippled from a sexually transmitted disease. He healed that man on the Sabbath day. And again, here come the religious critics. Uh, instead of rejoicing that this crippled man is walking in relationship with God and healed and having received a great miracle, uh, all they see is that Jesus is not doing things the way things normally happen. Never mind what the word says, right? And that's a great point. Point one about critics is um, critics tend to be, your biggest critics tend to be religious-minded people, right? You don't read here that it says, oh, yeah, the, and the pimps were sitting back and the pimps were just saying, like, yo, this guy's over here making people happy, man. This guy's giving life, right? It didn't say that the crippled people at Bethesda were like, yeah, man, he came through and healed one of our crippled homies over here, man. Who's he think he is doing something like that? You know, the, the biggest critics here are the religious-minded people. Religious-minded people tend to be the biggest critics. And if you're looking to do ministry, it's sad to have to even say this, but you got to prepare your kids, right? You got to prepare your spiritual children to understand the way this works. It will tend to actually be from religious minded people. Two, as you now see that they want to kill him for this work, and as he's up there, well, you know what? Let's read. We'll come back to two. Verse two. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. So this was actually one of the seven annual feasts that Israel was commanded to celebrate. Remember the first half of the feast point actually to the first coming of Christ. The second batch of feasts point to the second coming of Christ. Three of the feasts, it was mandatory that all the males, right, go to Jerusalem to worship Tabernacles was one of them. It's also called the Feast of Booths, or it's also called Sukkoth, right? The Feast of Tabernacles was a remembrance of when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness and slept out in a howling wilderness, and God gave them manna, bread, every morning supernaturally. God gave them water from the rock in the middle of the desert. And if you've been in the Middle Eastern desert, uh, it is cruel. I mean, down in the Dead Sea region, we just were there two months ago, about 50 of us from the church. The only word is cruel sun, right? Uh, I was, we were checking on each other, making sure people just didn't faint. A couple of people in this congregation almost did faint. Hey, if you almost fainted in the Dead Sea region or up at the Masada, would you just raise your hand for the church to say, maybe get a t-shirt, I almost fainted, or the thought of fainting crossed my mind. Uh, yeah, real deal. You real hands going up, right? So remember, the Lord actually split a rock and gave water to them. So he commanded them to keep a feast. And during this feast, they would actually go sleep out in their yard, or they would even make little tents to live in on their uh, flat roofs. And it was a time to bring your kids. And for seven days, you slept outside under the starry sky, and you rehearsed how the Israelites were brought out of Egypt and they were led through the wilderness, which people said would be the, the, the best way to kill a group of people. God led them into the wilderness and furnished them. No child died from heat. No child died from starvation. He totally met all their needs as Jehovah Jireh. That's what Tabernacles was. And every year in the fall, they were commanded to actually stay in little tents, leave the comforts of their 
couch and their TV and their remote, go outside, sleep in a tent under the stars, and just rehearse God's faithfulness and taking care of them in the wilderness. Well, right now, it's tabernacles, right? Verse 2. So his brethren, Jesus' brethren, underline brethren, Jesus did have brothers. Jesus also had sisters, right? Remember, Mary was a virgin when she conceived with child by the Holy Spirit, which is Christ our Lord. Mary was a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14 had prophesied. This will be the sign that you'll know that the Messiah is come. A virgin will actually become pregnant with child, right? So Mary was a virgin, but after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph did have sons and daughters. So Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters. Same mother, obviously, but different father. <clears throat> Joseph was just Jesus' foster father. So his brethren are here, and his brethren don't believe in him. Um, in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, there's a scene where it said they try to physically grab him once because they said he's insane, he's beside himself. It's almost like they tried to grab him and 302 him, if you will. Um, but they did believe on him after he resurrected from the dead. James actually wrote the book of James. Jude wrote the book of Jude. And if you read Acts chapter 1, verse 14, they are in the upper room with the 120 waiting for the Holy Spirit to fall on the day of Pentecost. So it's very important that when we mention Jesus' brothers opposing him, you have to finish the story and share how the scripture also makes clear that not only did they believe on him, not only were they in the upper room after the resurrection, right? But they actually, two of them penned books of the New Testament. So now his brothers say this to him. Depart and go to Judea that your disciples may see the works that you do. For there is no man that does anything in secret, and he himself who seeks to be known openly, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. What they're basically saying is this. If you're really the Messiah, if you're really God in the flesh, go and do your miraculous 4th of July stuff down in Judea right now at the temple while everyone is packed around because they're saying this. No one, if you're really God in the flesh, and again, look at this critical spirit. It sounds, it's religious based. It sounds like it makes sense, but it makes no sense. And what they're basically saying is this. If you really are the Messiah, go and do more big miracles. Do something bigger than big right now while everyone is down there in Judea because no one, look at what they say, no one does these things and no one wants to do this in secret if they really are who they are. Um, if you do these things, go and show yourself to the world. So the second thing you want to put down about critics is one, Critics tend to be religious-minded people, or you could say the worst critics or the biggest critics tend to be religious-minded people. So if you're sitting here right now and you're like, yeah, I, I'm not critical, man. Everything I do is discernment. You know, critics are out there in the world. Again, the biggest critics you see coming against Christ were those in religious garb, uh, those with some form of a religious uh, thing going on, and they're sincere. They think they're doing the right thing, but they're just off, right? And critics tend to really be sincere. They think they're doing the right thing, but critics are just off, right? The second thing about critics, right, is they, they think they're free thinkers, but they're really thinking in the back of their mind of what the status quo would say. So the brothers are saying, hey, if you're really the Messiah, then go show yourself because no one, if you're really God in the flesh, no one would keep this secret. They would show everything openly. And then look at this at the end of verse 4. If you are the Messiah, go show yourself to the world. Basically, in their mind, it's almost like there's a status quo in the back of their mind of, of what needs to be met. There's, there's a public acceptance that needs to happen. And let me just share something with you again. The biggest opponent of the church today radically serving the poor. The biggest opponent of the church today radically serving the widowed, radically serving the sick, is actually the church. 
The biggest opponent of the church doing these things is the church. Just like in many ways during the civil rights era, some of the biggest opponents of desegregation was the church. Why? Because it was radical and going against the status quo. It was going against the status quo to desegregate uh, Billy Graham's uh, harvest crusades, to go and remove the ropes, which they eventually did, right, was going against the status quo. So here what you see them doing is this. They're saying, wait a minute, we need to see the public. We need to see. In order for us to believe that this is, that you're of God, Jesus his brothers are saying this. Follow this. In order for us to believe that you're of God, we need to see X, Y, and Z people who hold weight in the back of our mind also see it. And if they don't see it, we don't see it. And until they see it, we won't see it. Do you see that? So the first thing about critics, the, the biggest critics tend to be religious-minded people. The second thing is critics tend to think they're free thinking, but they're really trying to think according to the status quo. So it's kind of like somebody looks at a ministry, somebody looks at something that's happening, and instead of seeing if it lines up with the word or not, they're looking at, well, would it line up with what my church grandmothers would think about it? Does it line up with what my church aunties would think about it? Does it look like what a whole denomination would think about it? But what is it all about? Why, did we, why were we given the word? Why do Christians die so that the word could be made readily? Why do Christians die smuggling this into restricted nations so people can have the Bible in their hand? Because the word is the final authority, right? If the word approves of it, we do it. If the word does not approve of it, we do not do it. And then even while you're doing it, you still check what? The word. It says in Psalms 138 verse 2, God has exalted the word above his own name. Not church tradition above his own name. Not, oh, this is the way we do things above his own name. Not even the American church. As much as we think the American church is just so much the best thing since apple pie. It is all the word, right? Let God be true and every man a what? A liar, right? So they're saying, yo, man, Jesus, go and show yourself publicly. Because what they're saying is, yo, the status, you're not doing things according to the status quo. And, in, and unless the status quo okays it, I'm not comfortable with it. Never mind what the word says. What they should be saying is, if you are the Messiah, would you lead us in the scriptures of what the scripture says about the Messiah? That is what they should be saying, right? Another thing about critics is you see, uh, they're doing all the talking. Critics tend to do all the talking and don't ask a lot of questions. They tend to do all the talking. Their mind's already made up. Their mind's already made up here. Jesus, we've been, we, we got something to tell you. If this is who you are, go and do this. I mean, can you imagine if you even thought you were talking to who maybe 0.01% chance could indeed be God in the flesh? Is that the way you come to him? Or would it be couched with a little more caution? I tend to be wrong a lot. <laughs> I could be wrong. I have found myself tripping off of far less. Um, could you help us navigate this thing, Jesus? But instead, in their mind, it's like, no, no, you got to go to Jerusalem. You got to do greater works. And, that, and we need to see the public approve. If the public, if the religious public approves, we'll approve. And until the religious public, aka the status quo approves, we won't approve. Do you realize how dangerous that is? How much of the church today is still stuck in that very thing? Now do you see why Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, the yeast of the Pharisees. What does yeast do? Yeast, you only have to put a little bit of yeast in a ball of dough. What does yeast do? It spreads and it puffs up. You only need a little bit of this spirit in you. And if we're not regularly examining our hearts for this yeast, just as you only need a little bit of yeast and a big thing of dough, you only need a little bit of this stuff inside of you before it spreads and fills our whole body, before it can spread and fill a whole church. And mind you, they think they're right right now. But let me tell you, we're going to meet more. Let's just keep reading, right? It says in verse 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. You know, one thing just to share real quick before we move on, if you want to talk about the loneliness of Jesus... Think of how many people have faced public opposition, but at least they had their friends and their family to go home and privately just be encouraged and the faithfulness of their family. Now, even that is hard. 
to have all public opposition, but you, you still can go home and you got your, your kith and your kin to just uh, okay and embrace? You want to talk about the loneliness of Jesus? Jesus didn't even have that. Here he had public opposition, and then what did he go home to? His brothers actually, Mark 3.21, at one point trying to grab him and restrain him because they said he's lost his mind. They literally are trying to like, you know, yoke him up and take him away like you would a crazy person. The loneliness of Jesus. Let me just share, as we did a message on loneliness uh, in the last two weeks, if you need a friend for your loneliness, what does it say in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16? Because of what he endured, he will understand and can so advocate and so give you. He knows exactly what you need, what touch of the Holy Spirit you need, how much of the Holy Spirit you need, what the Holy Spirit needs to say to you first when he comes into that lonely place of your heart or your lonely corner. He gets it because he walked among us. You cannot do a deep enough study on the loneliness of Christ as a form of suffering so that now he can comfort us when we suffer in our different spaces of loneliness. Isn't it amazing when you study the word and really get in, you see so much. That's why we love doing verse by verse. So again, just again, you know, disregard the temptation to just say, oh, you know, I know verse by verse, but this is kind of a slower part. Can we have like a fast part again? A funny part again? And then pastors have to disregard the temptation to say, Oh, this is going to be a slower part today. Maybe I should fast forward to another part. Every word of God, it says in the Bible, is what? Profitable. And it behooves us to look at everywhere. I mean, look at how much we could literally stop right now and just in what someone would call the intro credits to the chapter, how much have we already, how much daily bread have we already gotten in the last 20 minutes? Amen? So they did not believe in him. Then Jesus said this to them. My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. What he's saying is, and the Greek word for time is opportunity. My opportunity, my opportunity to do these things has not yet come. And you have to remember, what is the ultimate? They're saying to him, go and do the ultimate sign in Jerusalem now so people will believe in you now. What is the sign that Jesus is going to give everyone but in God's timing? He's going to be nailed to a cross. He's going to be buried. And he's going to raise again on the third day, just like he told them. Don't you remember? That's why in John chapter 2, they said, give us a sign. What's your authority to be talking and doing the stuff you do? He said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days. The sign is coming. It is going to be the resurrection. And we need to remember that. In a world where it seems like there's so many religious leaders and so many different religions, the sign, yes, all the miracles point to the ultimate sign. The sign, the reason we gather here and not in a mosque or not in another temple or in another establishment of an Eastern religion is because there's one sign, the ultimate sign that sets this apart. Christ rose from the dead, born of a virgin, walked the earth, fulfilled scripture, raised the dead, gave sight to the blind, healed lepers, gave, uh, you know, caused the deaf and the lame to walk. And then what? Ultimately, he went to the cross, died, and then rose again on the third day. That's why he's saying, my time is not yet. But look at what he says here. But your time is always ready. Your opportunity is always ready. What he's basically saying is, I know my time from the Father. Me and the Father are walking and talking. I know what my time is. Your time is now to go. And that's point three about critics. Critics tend to focus on what someone else should be doing, but always missing their own opportunities. Jesus says it right there. My time is not yet. Like, he's almost like saying, mind your business. I know my time. Me and the Father, everything, this, this lines up with the Father's timing and, and the Word. But, but your time is now. You go. You go to the pool of Bethesda and hug somebody. You go to the pool of Bethesda. Maybe you can't raise a crippled person, but you could take them a cup of coffee. Your time is now, though. And that is point three about critics. Critics always tend to focus on what someone else should be doing differently. And, but really what the conversation is, what about your opportunities? What could you be doing differently, right? Oh, man, you know, I would do this, and I would do that, and I would do this and that. 
Well, you had an opportunity with a little kid at the gas station who asked you, could he pump your gas for a dollar? What about your opportunity and the way you brushed him off like he was nothing? You, what, let's talk about your opportunity, but that's what critics do. They find the satisfaction, and that's what religion does. Religion, you see, relationship feeds off of the Word of God and off of the Spirit of Christ. Religion feeds off of being weird. Relationship flows and, and feeds off of, again, the Word of God, right? And the Spirit of God Religion feeds off being weird. When we get into this weird place, it feeds off of being more weird. When we get in this critical place, it feeds off of trying to find, it's almost like gnawing on this, you're done criticizing this, and then like it just leads you to want to chew on something bigger and find something else to chew on. It feeds off weirdness. I mean, you talk like this and you're just like, wow, Jesus, <laughs> thank you, not just for dying for like, the, the ugly sins that everyone would call ugly, but even those ugly religious sins that are just as ugly and can even be more damaging, right? So he says, I know my time, but your time is always ready. Let me just ask, because what he's saying is, your opportunity is always ready. How many of you fall in that trap where it's just easy to sit back and think that your spiritual exercise for the day is worrying about and criticizing what someone else is doing for the Lord and how they should be doing it differently when you're not spending any time grieving over your own missed opportunities, your own missed callings, you know, so worried about what someone else is trying to do and what they feel called to do, you're not even grieved at all or even worried that you might miss your calling. But you somehow feel that there's this this, this fulfillment in criticizing what someone else is doing. Paul would write to a man named Archippus who lived in Colossae, and he said, tell Archippus to take heed to his own ministry that he fulfills it. Our concern should be that we fulfill, that we find out what our orders are from heaven, and our concern should be, am I doing those orders or not? And I will just go make myself available places because I just want to know. I'm just going to make myself, well, oh, it says in the Bible that God's not looking for ability. He's looking for availability. You might just find me making myself available places. And I'm not coming to talk either because I can't talk and listen at the same time. I'm just available. I'm just here. I'm just over here. What are you doing? Nothing. Making myself available, right? But then what happens is so many even think, and what the critical spirit could do, you show up thinking you're showing up to be available, and you're actually being critical the whole time. So your body language and your location looks like you're right, but your head's still wrong because you're there. So look, this is designed, you guys, for us all to embrace this and say, wow, I could see why Jesus warned about this kind of religious stuff over and over again. But then again, the end of the chapter, he gives the invitation of how to be free. I mean, how many want to be free, right? And, and it's a daily freedom that we walk in. How many want to be free of a critical spirit, right? How many want to be like a Barnabas? Barnabas means son of comfort, where people actually, when you walk away, they're not thinking about the criticism you had about them, right? They're comforted when you walk away. What the church needs are Barnabases, Sons and daughters of comfort, when you get on the scene and when you leave, there's an uplift. Not a, oh, well, I don't know, and, uh, well, or, or people grieved because of what came out of your mouth. Now, do you see why the scriptures even says, let your speech be always seasoned with grace and with salt so the hearers may be built up. Now, that means we can challenge one another, and we should. It says Aquila and Priscilla even pulled Apollos aside, showed them a more excellent way. That doesn't mean that we just put aside showing people how to grow and be better. But you know what I love? I love that whatever Apollos' issue was, the Bible doesn't tell you. It just says Apollos was a man in ministry. He was a gifted man, but there was something off. Aquila and Priscilla, it says they pulled him aside and showed him a more excellent way. But it do what, don't you want to know? The nosy side of you wants to know. Yo, I wonder what he did, man. I wonder what was up with bro, Right? But the scriptures honors that. It's like, no, no, no. They just showed him a more excellent way. It's not for us to know. So we do need Aquila and Priscilla's in the church. We do need Barnabas's. But what we see in John 7, this is the biggest hindrance to the church. This is why a lot of people actually are afraid to get in the ministry. 
Not worried about what the guy on the corner is going to do or what the, you know, the, 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 the guy down here, you know, uh, just, just totally psychotic. Uh, they're worried about how the church is going to treat them, right? Wow. But it's also an encouragement in this. My time has not yet come. Verse 6. Your only audience should be the audience of one, which is Jesus Christ. Dogs howl at the moon all night. <laughs> moon keeps shining, right? Your calling is to know your ministry and your timing, and God will let you know that. Now, you should have your circle and the multitude of counsel there safety, right? There's, this, this is not, the opposite of this is not a Lone Ranger spirit. Like, oh yeah, man, I read John 7. Now, I don't care what nobody says, man. I be reading my Bible. I be quoting my Bible. I make sure it's right, and then just forget everybody. Forget, no, no, no. In the multitude of counsel, there's safety. Unity in the church is the objective. We all want to move as a body. You know, your knees don't want to run off and leave, you know, femurs and shoulder blades behind. The name of the game is everyone to get it. That's why we labor. We talk. That's why in Acts 15, they sat and labored over, okay, what is this issue here? We're to move together. But there also is, at the end of the day, you've got to walk in the calling God has. But here's the thing, and write this down as well. Jesus said, wisdom is justified of its children. If something is really of God, everyone is going to see it. If something's really of God, that's a beautiful thing. Fruit talks. That's why you don't have to do a bunch of rapping. Fruit will talk. So the, but, but, but the thing about fruit is everyone knows that grapes are sweet. <laughs> if you're the only one saying, oh my gosh, this grape is so sweet, and everyone else is saying it's sour, it might be time to, to, to recalibrate. If you're the only one calling it a watermelon and everyone else is calling it, you know, um, crab apples, might be time to recalibrate. Fruit will talk eventually, right? So let's keep reading. So Jesus says to them in verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but me it does hate because I testify of it that the works are evil. Here he's even getting into Jesus' coming again to wage war against a world, a, a, a dark world system, but even against the darkness of human hearts when it makes religious systems, right? He says to them in verse 8, you go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to the feast because my time is not yet come. So what he's saying to them is, look, doesn't the word, this is what he's saying. Remember, Deuteronomy commanded that the Jewish males all go up to the feast for tabernacles. See what he's telling them? You do what the word's telling you to do. I'm not going yet. <laughs> now, he is going to go in a couple of days, but not in the way that they're saying. Do you see what he's telling the critics? You just follow what the word of God is telling you to do. What is the word telling you to do? And that's a great thing for all of us to ask ourselves. You know, instead of wondering on what someone else is doing, Am I applying my heart to doing what the Word of God is telling me to do? What is the Word of God telling me to do? Never mind what it's telling this person to do. Peter said the same thing. Jesus prophesied of how Jesus would be martyred. First thing Peter wanted to know, well, what about John? I haven't heard John get any bad news, right? Misery loves him, right? What kind of bad news you got for John? And Jesus says, well, what does it matter to you if I tell John to stay alive until I return? You follow me. Peter, don't worry about John. Worry about Peter, right? Jesus is telling them this here too. He's almost saying like, while you're talking to me, isn't the word commanding y'all to do something? You go to the feast. You follow what the word is saying to do. So verse nine, when he had said these words to them, he stayed in Galilee. Verse 10, but when his brethren were gone up, he went up also to the feast, but not openly, but he went secretly. What it means is he didn't go in the giant Galilean caravan. Where you, it would just be just like traffic pours into you know, the city on a Friday night. Traffic would pour down the Roman road. Everyone's going. He didn't go openly. He didn't go in the caravan. He went by himself privately. So he does go, but he doesn't go in the context of what they're saying it had to look like. He's not, he's not responding to the critics or the haters. Do you see what I'm saying? Are y'all following this? Yeah, do you realize this is deep stuff? How many of you read this ahead and you're like, wow, I didn't see any of this when I read this? But you see, that's the beauty of reading first, then coming to church, and you get to see, okay, all right, I get this, right? And then also understanding the cultural backdrop and different things. Um, and again, but next week, I'm going to give you some great Bible reading tools with this, right? So he goes up, verse 11, then the Jews sought him at the feast and they said, where is he? Underline the Jews. Here's the next group of haters. 
The Jews, whenever it says the Jews, it doesn't just mean all of the Jewish people. It means the Jewish leaders. So now the Jews are there. And what are they saying? Where is he? I mean, there's groups of critics in this. He's, that's why these are called the, the confrontation sermons, because all the critics and haters are confronting him now, right? But again, it'd be one thing if they were confronting him with the word of God. They're not. They're confronting him with Religi- religiosity. They're confronting him with a little bit of scripture and a little bit of assumption and a little bit of, well, this is how we always do it. And a little bit of, well, I got the gift of discernment. I mean, how many things have just gone, how many bombs have been dropped in the church uh, by someone who claimed they had the gift of discernment, right? <laughs> First thing they should have discerned is that <laughs> what they're saying does not line up with the word of God or the spirit of God, right? So now the Jews are there and they're like, where is he? So remember, Just some months back, at the Passover, Jesus healed the crippled man. So they're looking for him now because they want to kill him for healing a guy on the Sabbath day, one. And two, they know he has to report to Jerusalem because he's a Jewish male. So the Jewish rulers, they're putting the word out. Like, yo, when you see the guy, he looks kind of like this. Looks, you know, this build, this, that. Stonemason, good build guy. Even though the Bible doesn't tell us what he physically looked like, we know that Jesus would definitely look like a man's man, if you will. I don't like to use that term, but basically what you would imagine, of, it wasn't a carpenter, he was a stonemason. So it wasn't just someone, you know, just like whittling little like dreidels or something. It was someone landscaping, E.P. Henry blocks, breaking blocks. There was no wet saws. And so you can imagine what his build was like. Now imagine what it looked like when Jesus was flipping the money changers tables and grabs a rope and makes a whip and starts chasing everyone out who was uh, robbing people for money in the temple. Right. Okay. So they're like, where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people. Would you write this down as point four about critics? Critics tend to do their talking and murmuring. It's not, hey, you know, like, can we just sit down and get in the word and let's just see what the word says? It usually takes place in the context of murmuring and often not with the person they want to talk to. They murmur to someone else. You see that? I mean, look at how if you just look through this chapter, you see that. But again, this is what I'd recommend. It's easy to look at this and say, oh, yep, this fits JoJo to the T. <laughs> this fits Tina to the T. This chapter should be called Tina and JoJo. No, what it behooves us to do, <laughs> right, is to say, yo, let me look at, man, let me let this searching light look at this in me, right? Because I believe the best way to fix the problem of the critical spirit is to just be an agent of love and encouragement where it's just, can, even though criticism is contagious, one person hears a criticism, I don't know. Well, didn't that happen in the wilderness? Hey, man, it was better when we lived in Egypt. Yeah, man, it was better when we lived in Egypt. Yeah, Moses is going to get us killed. Yeah, God's going to, he brought us out here to kill us. And it said that, what happened? That it spread to a whole camp of people. Well, guess what? The spirit of Christ The zeal of Christ, the beautiful heart of Jesus is also contagious. So I believe the solution to it is not, you know, every Facebook post, yeah, you're critics, you're haters. No, I believe the biggest solution is just walking out the best you can, the life of Jesus, the encourager, Jesus, the comforter, Jesus, the radical server. And that, I believe, is more contagious than a spirit of criticism. That's how I believe we win. That's how I believe we change the church. Because some do fall in that trap. They see the critics, they see the haters. And you ever read someone's social media posts and you could tell it's, it's, oh, it's definitely directed at somebody, right? And it'd, be, it'd say something like this, haters. And it'd just be like the emoji like this, <laughs> right? And you're like, oh, they, yeah, they're talking to somebody, you know what I mean? Or like, you, you, you understand what I'm saying. I think that that is a trap of the devil as well. Because yeah, c- critical spirit, it does, it does grieve you. It is a wet sandwich at the picnic. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It is a wet sandwich at the picnic. Go to, oh, if you don't know what that is, go to a picnic and <laughs> pour out your water all on the bottom of your basket so when you get there, your sandwich is wet. And you know what a wet sandwich is. It rains on, it rain on your parade, if you will. But I believe that that is also a trick of the enemy to, even though it does bother you, it does grieve you when it happens, to get you pulled into now, you're focused on that as well. It could be a distraction, in other words. So let's just let all of this hit here, um, and then let's keep going. So there was much murmuring among the people. Some said he's a good man. 
Other ones said, no, he's a deceiver. I mean, look at this. Jesus came down. He was called a wine bibber. He was called a warlock. He was called a deceiver. I mean, have you just stopped to think of the, not just the criticisms, but the character assessments that were leveled against him? Here they said, no, no, he's a deceiver. He's a snake. He's a deceiver. Others said, oh, yeah, the, the, the miracles he does, he does it by the spirit of Belial. He's a warlock that works by the power of Satan. Others said, oh, he drinks wine with sinners. He's an alcoholic, man. He, he's, a, he's a wine bibber. This is what was thrown against him, right? And let's keep going. Verse 13, however, no one spoke openly about Jesus for fear of the Jews. There was such a hatred of him from the religious rulers that you would whisper this stuff, but you didn't want to be caught publicly talking about Jesus. Definitely not publicly uh, applauding the beautiful things he was doing. Do you realize how dark this day is now when Jesus comes down, right? I think in our minds we could kind of see it as like, okay, there was a dark world of pimps and prostitutes and gangsters, you know, and white collar gangsters and, and alleyway gangsters. And then there was the religious temple and Jesus came down and the religious temple got behind him and he waged war against this. No, man, he comes down in the middle. It's dark on both sides. And in the middle, you just have people that want truth that want to really know God, and they can't find anyone to really reflect it or or instruct them. This is a dark day. It's important to share this because we could kind of look at 2022 and just say like, well, this day is messed up, tore up from the floor up, as if it's too big for God. But when you study this gospel account, don't get it twisted. Yes, we let the kids get started coloring in these little scenes, and everyone has smiles, and they use, you know, nice crayons and, you know, the Crayola box. But don't, now we're adults now. We're ready for the meat. This is some ugly scenarios. And he is coming to take the religious system and a dark world and flip both of them over and reinstitute the spirit, the living water, the refreshing living water of God. Amen? How many of you has he done that in your life? My own testimony, I hated the church. You know what's crazy? I used to sit on churches and get high and drunk, and I had such disregard for the church, I didn't even know it was church steps I was sitting on. You could have told me it was the steps of a grocery store, meaning my brain, it, it went from hatred to it doesn't even exist. People would roll out, you know, rip out Bible pages and roll joints with them because I just felt that there was just so much hypocrisy and where's the love and and, and you're looking just for, you know, an answer. And I remember a little kid, I just wanted my, I wanted my confirmation to change my little broken, tumultuous life. And I remember I raised my hand. I didn't raise my hand actually. I yelled out in the middle of English class with Mr. Vozar, my freshman year. And I was a goofball in class. Maybe you guys can't imagine that, but I was. (laughs) And I said, Mr. Vozar, uh, what is it, Aaron? You're not going to have to worry about me acting up no more, Mr. Vozar. Never mind. No excuse me, sir. It just I wanted to talk. I said, I'm getting confirmed this weekend, and I'm going to be a new man when I come back. And he just looked at me like this. <laughs> like, yeah, okay, Aaron. And man, when I went up for that confirmation and that oil was put, and I was told this represented a rebirth, and man, and right afterwards, one of my homies, we were a block from the housing projects, one of my homies ran in. He just took his hand, and you read about it in my book. He just wiped the oil off. And I just wanted to throw him into hellfire myself, you know? Like, yo, you wiped off my trend. My change was on my forehead, and you wiped it off. But he was basically just showing what the reality was. I was nothing changed. And at that point, I said, religion doesn't work. The world is dark. Everything is dark. But then what did Jesus do? He radically came through all of that and showed me its relationship. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here, right? Is this beautiful or what? So they're murmuring. They now go through this whole thing of, well, you're, you're not taught from Jerusalem, so you're not real. Then he says, well, I'm not self-taught, I'm God-taught, right? And that's just what he's getting into uh, when he says, basically, verse 16. My doctrine is not mine, it's him that sent me. Just because I'm not taught in your religious structure, just because I wasn't raised in your little religious box, does not mean that I'm self-taught. I'm God-taught. What is he bringing back? He's bringing back the word of God uh, as the authority and not little boxes. Because now they're saying, yo, man, we, we don't recognize you. We don't know you. No one knows you. You weren't trained here. What's your doctrine, right? He goes through all of this. 
And I, um, I, I don't know whether we should come back and do a part three or whether I should just race ahead uh, to his invitation on the last day of the feast. Which one y'all want? Because I could ask Janae. You know what Janae's answer is going to be already. She tells me a 90-minute sermon is too, too, too short. Now, we'll do, do we stop and come back? Or, or do we keep going? To, so you see the invitation that he gives. So you understand when he gives this invitation at the end of the chapter, then you'll really get who he's giving it to. It's just a bunch of critical folk just gnawing on each other and totally unfulfilled. And what does he do? He doesn't say, you know what? Get away. You'll never get touched by my Holy Spirit. He invites them and says, let me, let me direct you to me and I can set you free from being a critic to a conqueror. A critic to one conquered by my love and to one who conquers the world with love. Because you think about it, when we see someone, we're either criticizing them, right? Or we're conquering them with love. But we could get it so twisted to where we actually think, you know, a lot of us, when we're being critical, we actually think we're doing the best thing. Oh, I'm just giving you what you need. <laughs> no, the reality is you're giving no one what nobody needs. You know what I mean? But, but it's really being set free from a critic to one conquered by his love and one who conquers with love. It's, it's from being a critic to being a Barnabas. So do we keep going or what? Yeah, 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 I mean, come on, holler, holler at me. All right, keep going. All right, online. What, what, online, what was it? All right, keep going. Right. Okay. So... Jesus says this in verse 19, did not Moses give you the law and yet none of you keeps the law? Why do you want to kill me? He's saying, I'm the one taught by God and I'm completely righteous. You guys are sinners. You want to kill me for breaking the Sabbath? So now he's literally flexing his deity on them, right? The people answered and said this, you have a devil. Who seeks to kill you? I mean, uh, you know, I mean, man, 0.5 on critics. Uh, a critic... <laughs> They'll call you crazy before they even self-examine and self-reflect that maybe they're wrong, right? Is that deep? He just came and he's explaining all this and they're just like, you're a devil, demon, right? <laughs> Chucky, bride of Christ. I mean, that's, their first response is, no, you're crazy, you're wrong. That's what a critical spirit will do. You'd expect them to say, you know what, Jesus? It's been some time since you healed that man on the Sabbath, We've had time to do something called reflect. And all that was motivated behind that was love. And you're right, Jesus, and he gets into this. Yes, even our own law says to circumcise a baby on the eighth day, even if it falls on the Sabbath. So if it's okay to circumcise a baby on the Sabbath, it obviously has got to be beautiful to heal a crippled man for 38 years on the Sabbath. We've had time to reflect. But again, point five about critics. They will be quicker to say you're crazy or you are wrong or this, that, or, or you're anything than to actually reflect. Because look at their reaction. Jesus is unpacking all of it. And what's their first response, verse 20? <laughs> you, just when you're thinking there's a breakthrough, they're like, um, you have a devil. <laughs> uh, yes, and the problem is you. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've been listening. We've been talking. It's been a long day. And after much reflection, quote, unquote, it's you. You're a devil. The real, problem, worse, the real problem is you're worse than I thought. <laughs> That's what they're saying to Jesus. That's our conclusion. Uh, we came here thinking you were just a devil, lowercase d. Now our conclusion is you're devil, capital D. I mean, that's point five about murmuring. They will be quicker to call you something, label you something, before they even reflect and say, maybe I'm just wrong. Maybe I'm just critical. Maybe I just need to go sit somewhere and be quiet. Maybe I need to just go sit somewhere and be quiet and read my Bible. All right. <laughs> Janae said, yeah, do that. <laughs> Let's go. Yo, again, th this is deep, isn't it? Now do you see why these are called the confrontation sermons, right? Let's keep going. But again, behind all of this is love. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. These folks are lost in their blind spots, lost. And what is he doing? He's loving them back. So again, the, the main thrust of today too, don't come out of this sermon, you know, where it's just like, yo, man, we're having a witch hunt for critics. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's love because this, there's not a touch that anyone needs from Jesus that we don't also need ourselves. And it says in Galatians 6.1, if your brother or sister be overtaken in a fault, restore them. And the Greek word for restore is the same gentleness you would use to reset a bone. It says, and consider yourself too, lest you be tempted. Don't you be all haughty because you, the Lord may, the Lord see you be haughty. He'll allow you to struggle with the same thing next week just to show you you're no different than them, right? 
So he goes and unpacks all of this with them. And then verse 27, they're basically saying, or really, let's go to verse 25. Then said some of them in Jerusalem, is not this the one they're seeking to kill? Then they say in verse 26, but wait, he's speaking so boldly and no one's saying anything to him. Do the rulers know that this is the very Christ? Then they say this in verse 27, but we know that this man, we know where Jesus comes from. They're saying, but when the Messiah comes, it says that no one's going to know where he comes from. Well, you know what they're doing here? And here's point six about critics. Critics tend to take a little bit of scripture for their criticism, but they're taking the scripture out of context. You see, Malachi 3.1 does predict and say, the Messiah will come suddenly in the temple. But it also says in Micah 5.2 that he would be born in Jerusalem, and in Isaiah that he would be a Nazarene. Look at what they're saying. They're just taking Malachi 3.1. Because it says he'll come suddenly in the temple, no one will know where he's from, and they're missing other parts of Scripture. Another thing about a critical spirit is it'll be someone, they'll have a verse, but it will be a, a verse, will be the wood in their criticism, but it will most likely be a verse out of context and not in context with other scriptures. Do, do you see how deep this is? I mean, it's just amazing how much the more we read the word of God, I mean, imagine how much fun we're going to have as we journey through the word together with, in this kind of delving in for the next year. How fun is it going to be as a church? How, how much are we all going to grow? Most of all, how much are we all going to know the heart of our Father by this time next year, God willing? Amen? All right. Anyone that came in late, we're going to do a Through the Bible in a Year program together as a church family starting January 1st. So look, you guys, let's just go here now. Verse 37. Because you guys get the gist of what's going on. Do you get the gist of what's going on? And this is where I'm going to leave it. Next week, we are going to come in with a part three, but we're just going to talk more about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit as the solution for my critical spirit, the Holy Spirit as the solution for the way I just see everything in such a negative light. The Holy Spirit is the solution for the fact that I hate the way I always see things in a negative light. I want to see things in a positive light, but I can't help but see things in a negative light because I've been doing it so long how the Holy Spirit is the answer for that right? So we're going to, the Holy Spirit is the answer. We're going to focus on the work of God when he breathes on you, the Ruach, the Spirit of God as the answer for everything ugly we're reading about today. So there's good news. Everything we've read about today, there's hope for me, you, Jojo, Tina, remember, right? Our, our fake friends we created that we think this chapter was only for, you know? Um, reminds me of that song, you know, you're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. You know what I mean? Like, we could be so vain, we think this chapter is about someone else, but not us, right? But the Holy Spirit is the solution. Let me just get here, and then we're going to end. We're going to end right now. All right, Janae? Verse 37. Understand this, y'all. And, 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 and again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get out the way now. I'm going to move this here so I can really explain this. Tabernacles was a feast when you celebrated how God freed the Israelites, led them through the Saudi Arabian and Jordanian hot desert with a cloud during the day to keep them covered, a fire by night, gave them manna on the ground, and gave them water from a rock. It was to remember that no matter what you go through in the wilderness of life, God will always provide for you. It was designed, it was a festival designed for them to look back and count their blessings and the blessings on their forefathers and know that God will always provide for you in the desert, whether the economy crashes, whether the job market fails, you know, whatever it is, emotionally you're dry, the wilderness, you're just dry and you feel dry towards God. No matter what wilderness you're in, this feast was designed to help you remember God will always keep you fed and tended to and loved on and safe in whatever wilderness it was, okay? So here it is. What they would do is for seven days of the feast, and mind you, people are coming to Jerusalem during the day, but at night they're sleeping in tents, tents in their backyard, tents on their flat roofs. Hey, Daddy, why are we out here again? Well, this is to remember when our forefathers were in the desert in tents, God met their needs. God will meet your needs. It was designed to be educational. It was designed to be inspirational. It was designed to get people back into just loving the heart of God, all right? So what they would do every day, because remember, when they were in the wilderness and there was no water, and they murmured, 
Moses smote a rock. Yes? And what happened when Moses hit the rock? It gushed with water. And there's a book called The Exodus Case. You need to study this book, The Exodus Case. Not only have geologists located in Saudi Arabia a mountain where the top of the mountain, remember the mountain burned with fire when Moses and the Israelites beheld God's presence? They've taken rock from that mountain and they sent it to scientists at John Hopkins University and they didn't tell them where they got the rock from. And they said whatever rock, wherever this was from, was exposed to a level of vehement heat that we cannot even calibrate. One. Two, right near that same rock, look up the Exodus case. Right near that same rock, they found a giant rock that has a fissure in it, a giant split. That, and not, it wasn't a rock, a large cleft of a rock that no one could explain why it would have a fissure, but that would indeed look like the place where Moses smote it and water came out. All right? So it says in 1 Corinthians 10.4, that that rock was Christ. When Moses hit that rock and the water came out, that was a sign to the Israelites that a Messiah would come, that the real thirst is a spiritual thirst. And just as he was hitting a rock to meet their physical thirst in the desert, a Messiah would come who would be smitten, split on a cross, and water would come, refreshment, spiritual refreshment would come from him. So picture this now. What they would do the seven days of the feast is they would go down. Where's my people that went to Israel with us? They would go down to the pool of Siloam. They would fill giant jars of water, bring them up, and they would pour them down the steps of the temple. And as the water poured down, Israelites would tell their kids, yes, this is what it was like when the rock was split in the wilderness. Do you get it now? On the eighth day, which was a Sabbath, when the feast was over, no water would be poured down. Because what it was meant to convey is, we're still waiting. We're still waiting for the true water, the true thirst quenching from heaven. So on the eighth day, no water was poured. Right? Now do you understand why it says in verse 37, in the last day, write in your notes, when no water was poured. That great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried and said, if any man thirsts, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture says, he's yelling this, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. You see, living water, what he's saying first, it's something that he's saying, if you're thirsting, you need, there's something outside of you that you need to invite into you. Second off, the effect it's going to have is it's not only going to refresh you, but now it's going to refresh others. He's basically telling a town full of haters and critics who only know how to be religious haters and critics how to now be a source of refreshing and blessing everywhere. So the question is this, when you go around folks, do you want them weighed down with all of your keen observations and criticisms? where you can just tell they're, they're not necessarily bummed to say bye to you. Oh, man, you mean I can't talk more? You mean I can't hear more of these criticisms? I'm so blessed right now. No, it's just kind of, okay, cool, see you later. Would you rather be that source of refreshment where it's like, no, 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 don't go? Or thank you for those words. He's saying, yo, believe on me, and out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Let me refresh you. Let me refresh that part of you that's unsettled, maybe the part of you that leads you to be so critical because at the heart of the matter, you're unhappy with you. You're unsatisfied in life with you. You're unfulfilled with you. Let me meet that with my love, with my touch. And then by that, you also will automatically go around and you will be that to others. It is true. You will treat others how you believe God treats you. He's saying, let me treat you right. And by that, you'll treat everybody. You will, you will walk around wanting to do nothing but just treat right. Is, is this deep or what? But do you see why now you have to study the whole context to get it? We better have the worship team come up. <laughs> Next week, we're going to really get into how to, just, how, to, how to be touched by God. I mean, we use that term all the time, right? Oh, I got touched by God. You hear someone, okay, it sounds great, but like, how does it happen? And how does it happen to someone like me? Or what if I'm just the biggest doubter in the world? I think everyone else could get touched, but not me, right? 
Well, look, look at Jesus' track record. Every personality type that came across him, no one left him the same. So that means everyone in this room is ripe to be touched by God. And next week, we're going to really look at that. Amen? Was this a rich time today? Wow. Are we enjoying the gospel of John? Isn't it rich? And again, I would just encourage you, just look at those, those points on the critic. And again, we just have to really, lest we let it slip, we have to really say, wow, what do I need to be freed from? And wow, where do I need to take my gaze off others and just focus on what God has for me? And I'll tell you this, you get into what God has for you, you're going to have so much fun. Oh, it could be dangerous, very taxing, health hazards, and even physical health included. But you will have so much fun when you are doing your ministry, you won't even have time to really criticize others. It's like stopping and eating filet mignon, you know, um, you know to, to eat like, you know, rotten food like, you know, in the backyard, like that the raccoon pulled out the trash. You just don't do it. And if you do do it, you're like, ugh. I mean, you know, because we're sinners, we still get weird. We still leave filet mignon to do dumb stuff. But even when you do, you, you, you correct yourself. Like, what, what the heck? I'm in the backyard eating trash at the raccoon. No, no, let me go back to the filet mignon. Do you follow what I'm saying? You get into what God has for you, you won't even want to cr be critical anymore. All you do is hope. You're just hoping the best for everyone. And you also realize that, man, so much blood had to be shed for me to even do ministry. <laughs> that how can you crit critique someone else, really, when you are aware of how much grace, how much blood <laughs> was necessary for this demon child to be allowed in the, in the, in the party? You follow what I'm saying? So this is what, this is the solution, y'all. So let's pray. Are you encouraged? Does anyone here today feel as though, wow, you're in a place where Jesus can't meet you? And now do you realize that when Jesus is giving the invitation, it's not to a bunch of people saying, Rabbi, Rabbi, teach us more of your beauty. No, it's haters and critics. He's got a devil. He's wrong. He's demon child. Man, he ain't the Messiah. He ain't doing it right. He ain't doing it right. Yo, this is who he's inviting to drink. That's our Jesus. Yeah. Father, we just thank you so much for who you are and who you're showing us to be. Lord, would you deliver us from religiosity and the letter of the law, which killeth, as you say in Corinthians, and the spirit that gives life. Lord, we will confess we are good. The world makes us a hater. The world makes us the biggest skeptic. The world system makes us a critic out of a way to protect ourselves, a way to survive, just a dark world we're raised in. But Lord, thank you that you are the potter and you know how to change us. And the change can only come from God. And may we all realize that today and even say it to ourselves. Change can only come from God. We're all messed up and we'll never be able to fix ourselves. Change can only come from God and only through the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood that forgives and the blood that heals. So we love you, we thank you. Lord, receive this morning's offering from us as worship and just thank you for all of what you give to us and that we could give to you. May it be used to love on this world and to share your good news. Give us wisdom with every penny. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. And of course, you can give.